If you were being hunted by a child-eating monster who can transform into your worst nightmare, what do you do? This sadistic clown feeds on your fear, and it will murder all of your friends if it isn't stopped. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the demonic clown Pennywise in IT. This boy will never see his family again. Georgie here is playing in the rain with his paper boat, when it sails straight into a sewer drain and he looks inside to see if he can reach it. The boy suddenly sees a pair of eyes staring back at him and finds a clown hiding inside of the drain. The man introduces himself as Pennywise the Clown, but Georgie here tells him that he needs to go back home. The clown reminds him to take back his paper boat, and when the kid reaches into the sewer drain, the man suddenly sinks his teeth into the little boy's arm and tears it off. The boy tries to crawl to safety, screaming in pain, but nobody is around to help him. The creature stretches its arm out and drags him back into the sewer drain, leaving no trace of the kid except a pool of blood. One year later, and nobody has found Georgie, but Billy here won't give up the search for his little brother. His friends are discussing how they should spend their summer break, but Billy wants their help exploring the sewers for any sign of Georgie. The boy walks home and enters the garage, but his dad has found a secret model of the town's sewage system and is upset. The kid explains that the drain where his little brother went missing is connected to the barrens and plans to look for him there, but his father doesn't want to hear it. The man has had enough and insists that his little brother is dead. He has no idea that his son is going to uncover a dark secret the town has been hiding for over 300 years. Okay, this dad is absolutely right, but he doesn't have to be such a dick about it. Bill here insists his brother is still alive and has even done research on the town's sewer systems to figure out where his brother might be, but there are two huge problems that the boy is not considering. Firstly, there were only two witnesses who saw the boy by the sewer drain. One of them refused to comment, but the woman here returned to find a pool of blood and this tells us almost everything we need to know. If it was a simple kidnapping, there wouldn't have been any blood at all, because the boy was small enough to be abducted without any struggle. Now, an 80 pound child contains 2.6 liters of blood, and you only need to lose 40% of that to die, which for Georgie here would be the same amount that's in this coke bottle. Judging by how much blood is at the scene of the crime, even after the rain washed most of it away, this is already enough evidence to convince us that he's dead without a doubt. Now, as tragic as that may be, there's an even bigger problem here. If you start connecting the dots, you'll realize that nobody in this town is doing anything to find their children at all. There are at least six other kids that have gone missing that year, but there's no sign of any active investigation into the disappearances. The fact that this kid is trying to convince his dad that Georgie might be in the Barrens is a clear indication that they haven't even bothered to check there. Now, what's most disturbing is that if anyone is qualified to look, it would be this dad here. According to the book, this guy is an electrician for Derry's local hydroelectric power corporation. It's his job to understand where the water in this town is flowing, so if there's any mystery for Bill here to solve, it should be why his dad isn't doing a damn thing to figure out where his son has gone. If this takes place in 1988, that's only 8 short years after John Wayne Gacy, also known as Pogo the Killer Clown, was arrested after killing 33 young boys. In this context, the parents and taxpayers of Derry should be hyper alert to 6 missing kids in a single year and demand answers from the police about the disappearances. But instead, they all settle for missing posters and a 7 o'clock curfew with no investigation. This is extremely strange behavior, and if Billy started investigating his father's complete apathy towards the situation instead of the sewer systems, he would quickly discover that every adult in this town is being brainwashed. Later in town, this kid Mike is delivering fresh meat for his summer job and parks in an alley near a butcher shop. Suddenly, he hears a sound behind him and turns around to find several hands reaching out trying to break free, and they're all burning alive. He approaches as the screams get louder, but that's when the door swings open, revealing a figure hanging from a meat hook. It waves at him as its eyes start glowing, but suddenly, a car comes speeding into the alley and he dodges out of the way. This bully screams at him to stay out of town and they drive off, but the kid is still haunted by what he's just seen. Meanwhile in the synagogue, this kid Stanley is taking a break from studying the Torah for his bar mitzvah and returns the book to his dad's office. He shields his eyes from a creepy painting of a woman with a long face and puts the book back on the shelf, but he hears something fall behind him. Turning around, he notices the scary painting on the floor and goes to put it back on the wall, but he's shocked when he realizes the woman from the painting is gone. He looks behind him and there in the shadows is the woman giving him an evil smile. The boy snaps out of it and runs out of the room before it gets too close. Okay, this kid needs to start praying a lot harder. Stanley here is afraid of a painting, which is a strange condition called spordal dyslexic cardophobia. 
But what's most interesting about this is that whatever the monster is, it already knew what he was afraid of and used it against him. Now, what he just witnessed was so bizarre that later he'll be trying to convince himself it was all in his imagination, and that's going to be a huge mistake. If you don't believe what you saw, then you won't modify your behavior or actions to protect yourself, and it makes it a lot easier to be haunted like this again. The source of his fear comes from a material possession that can be easily destroyed. So if it were me, I would walk back into the room, take the painting out of the synagogue, and burn it. Now, if he did this, he would soon realize that the creature that haunted him would return. So while this solution doesn't eliminate the problem, he'll be able to quickly learn more about what this thing is and what it wants from him. In the library, Ben here plans to spend his summer indoors reading. He's the new kid at school and hasn't made any friends, but when he starts looking into the town's history, things take a dark turn. He reads about a massive explosion on Easter in 1908 that killed 88 children. Looking through the pictures, he sees a boy's decapitated head high up in a tree and closes the book absolutely horrified by what he's just seen. That's when he turns around and sees a red balloon floating across the room, but nobody else in the library seems to notice it. Going to investigate, he looks through the doorway to find a smoking Easter egg at the top of the stairs and follows a trail of eggs leading him down into the library's archives. Suddenly, the lights start to flicker and he hears a noise behind him. Turning around, he sees a boy walking down the stairs, but he's missing his head, just like the kid in the book. Ben here is too afraid to move, but the headless creature starts chasing him, and the new kid runs further into the archives. But when Ben turns around to look, he sees the same clown that killed Georgie following after him. Suddenly, he bumps into the librarian, startling them both, and turns to realize that nobody else is there. Okay, this is instant nightmare fuel. He didn't even notice that behind him, something evil was watching him before he even went downstairs. But he's just discovered a gold mine of valuable information that could save a lot of people. This town has a long history of terrible events, and almost all of them have an eyewitness account or photographic evidence of a mysterious and unknown clown named Pennywise. Now, the stories of this book are so crazy that we might think it's a work of fiction, but if he dug a little further, he would have found that Branson Budinger, who wrote the book, was found dead shortly after publishing his research. It doesn't prove that the stories and photographs are true, but it certainly supports the pattern of tragic events. This killer clown has also made a huge mistake by revealing himself, because seeing it with your very own eyes helps confirm a series of other logical deductions and rules about the nature of this evil creature. The first thing it confirms is that the cause of these tragic events, including the recently missing children, trace back to the same evil clown. This means it's been haunting the town for hundreds of years, and that makes it supernatural, not human. Secondly, it tried to lure us away from the public to capture us, but as soon as the librarian arrived, the monster disappeared. That means you're never safe unless you're in the presence of an adult. That makes parents and adults a useful tool, and we need to keep them around for our safety, even if they never believe us. Thirdly, Ben was able to pick up the egg at the bottom of the stairs, so even though it's a supernatural entity, we have reason to believe we can still physically interact with it. This is a big deal, because if it's true, then we can logically conclude we might also be able to physically harm or even kill it under the right circumstances. Lastly, this book clarifies that these events are happening specifically within the boundaries of Derry and not anywhere else. By leaving the town, we might also be free from the boundaries of its influence and it won't be able to kill us beyond those borders. Now, information is this clown's worst enemy, because if you're informed, then you can be prepared. If it were me, I would be warning everyone in town and show them the proof in this book. It doesn't help that Ben here is a new kid, but if he started telling people, he would soon learn that other kids are being haunted as well, and they would be able to quickly band together, which is a much safer way to deal with the supernatural threat if it's trying to pick them off one by one. When all the kids finally admit to each other that they're being haunted, it's going to open up a lot more opportunities for us to beat this creature with some pretty crazy ideas. Leaving the library, the new kid is absolutely terrified of what just happened, but it's about to get even worse. The local bullies are waiting for him outside the building and plan to welcome him to the neighborhood as painfully as possible. They take in the lover's bridge where they're about to torture him, but that's when a car approaches. He screams out for help, but the passengers don't even look concerned for his safety, and as they drive away, a red balloon appears in the back seat. The leader pulls out his switchblade and begins carving his name into the kid's flesh. But the boy kicks the bully away and falls over the railing, tumbling down the hill towards the river. Furious, they jump down the chase after him, but they've lost his trail. On the other end of the river, Billy and his friends are exploring the sewer systems, looking for any sign of his brother Georgie. Eddie here is terrified of germs and refuses to join in the search, but suddenly Richie here finds a shoe floating in the water. Looking inside, they realize that it belongs to Betty Ripson, one of the girls that went missing only weeks ago, and it's evidence that these boys are onto something. That's when they hear the new kid, Ben, stumble into the river behind them. Realizing he's hurt, they offer to take him back into town. Meanwhile, this bully is still looking for the new kid and hears a sound coming from a tunnel nearby. 
Thinking it's him, he walks inside and uses an aerosol can to light his way. But as he travels deeper, he hears a voice calling out. Light in the tunnel, he's shocked to see four dead people appear in front of him. He runs back through the sewers in terror, but finds his escape blocked by a gate. Suddenly, this red balloon floats towards him and pops, revealing Pennywise the clown right before the kid is devoured. Okay. This might be horrifying, but at least he's taking down a bully, and that makes this a net positive. The evil clown is fed, and the streets of Derry are a little bit safer for a kid like Ben here. Now, as for this bully, there were two obvious mistakes he made that got him killed. First, he used his lighter and aerosol can to illuminate the tunnels, but didn't bother using it as a weapon when he was faced with a threat. Instead, this kid drops it in the water and runs in the wrong direction, trapping himself inside. The next mistake he made was not even trying to squeeze through these metal bars. He's a pretty skinny kid, and instead of letting these bars become a trap, we should try to turn them into a barrier for the fence, but he didn't even consider it as an option. Now with these obvious points out of the way, there are a few details that tell us more about this clown and how it operates. When the new kid was being bullied, these people drove by but didn't stop to help him. Now you might think that they realize that as senior citizens, they can't do much to intervene. But if you look at their faces, there is zero compassion or expression of concern for this kid's safety. This tells us that the monster can influence others' behavior, decision making, or perception of reality. And if the clown can influence them, it means adults will not be reliable for help. Now, this might actually be a blessing in disguise, because if the adults are apathetic to a child's safety, then we won't get in trouble for pushing this bully in front of the oncoming car. If we do this, then one of two things are likely to happen. Either it will force someone to stop the car to prevent hitting him and get out to help, or the clown will be controlling them and he'll run right over the kid, taking out the threat. It's a win-win, and if I have to suffer more pain to take that chance, then it's going to be worth the scars. Billy and his friends head back into town with the injured kid, and go to the pharmacy to buy medical supplies to treat him, but they don't have enough money. That's when they see this red-headed girl Beverly from their school walk into the aisle. They tell her they can't afford medical supplies to treat their friend, and she decides to help them out. The girl approaches the pharmacist and distracts him by knocking a rack of cigarettes over the counter. The boys take their opportunity to steal the supplies, and they leave the store to help their friend outside. Later, she finds them in the alleyway tending to the injured kid, and this boy invites her to come with them to the quarry tomorrow. The girl thanks them for the invitation and heads back home, but none of them realize that the clown is still watching them. The girl sneaks into her house, but is stopped by her creepy dad. He wants to know what she bought and asks if she's still his little girl, taking a long moment to smell her hair before letting her leave. She hates how he treats her and goes to the bathroom to cut her hair short, but this one action is going to come back to haunt her. Okay. All of these kids have such bad parents that it's easy to miss one crazy detail that proves the adults are being brainwashed and it's right in front of their noses. On two separate occasions, we can see a parent watching TV, but instead of sports or Wheel of Fortune, they're both watching the same children's program. Now, if I were to come home and find my mom or dad sitting alone in the dark watching Sesame Street, I would freak the f*** out. This is not normal behavior, and it's enough to question why they're acting so strangely. Eventually, they'll discover that their friend's parents are doing the same thing and realize that something very sinister is going on, but there's even more here that can tell us what it is. This television program had circus music in the background, and the host said that the word of the day is clown. Now, most of these kids don't know why that's significant yet, but Ben here has seen the clown with his own eyes. If he had heard what this kid show was saying, he would be able to figure out that the evil clown is brainwashing all the adults through the television. Once we figure this out, then logically we have to take it one step further. An evil supernatural entity would have no reason to limit itself to only one method of influence, so it's also incredibly likely that it's using the radio and other means as well. This creates the horrifying realization that literally every single adult within the borders of the town is under a spell, and the only way to break that spell is to knock them unconscious and get them out of dairy. I would kidnap my own parent, throw them in the back of the car, and drive out of town. We can apologize to them later because we're going to have a much better chance of surviving a supernatural threat if we can break an adult from their spell and get them on our side. But I would take this one step further. This might be 1989, but today in 2021, if a demonic clown was brainwashing my parents through our TV, the first thing I'm doing is going to my computer and deleting my search history, which is why I use the only VPN that protects you from actual ghosts. Huge shout out to this video's sponsor, CyberGhost VPN. In 2021, basically everyone should be using a VPN if they want to keep the things that they are doing online private. A VPN keeps your online browsing anonymous and encrypted, which makes it one of the safest ways to protect yourself from hackers and malicious websites. And there's a lot of other advantages too. 
Thanks to CyberGhost VPN, you can access geo-restricted content like region blocked videos on YouTube, social media, find better deals online, play games blocked near your country, and even get blocked libraries of over 35 streaming services like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, and many more. For example, with CyberGhost VPN, you can watch the special libraries from Netflix in the UK, Germany, and even Japan. CyberGhost VPN is available for all platforms, Windows, iOS, Mac, Android, smart TVs, and even gaming consoles. They have more than 38 million users and a 5-star rating on Trustpilot, precisely because it is very easy to use. You can use one subscription to protect up to 7 devices at a time, so you can share with your family and friends, and there's a 45-day money-back guarantee, so it's totally risk-free if you change your mind later. They also have 24-7 support, so you can reach them easily anytime. Get CyberGhost VPN's best deal ever. Just $2.19 a month plus 4 months free, which is 83% off using my link in the pinned comment and description of this video, and start protecting yourself today. The next day at the quarry, the boys are daring each other to jump into the water below, but the girl shows them up and bravely leaps off the cliff without hesitation. For now they're just kids enjoying their summer break, but things are about to take a very serious turn for them, and it all starts with Ben here. Sitting on the shore, this boy looks through the new kid's backpack and finds a folder full of articles on the town's dark history. The others take a look as Ben tells them that the amount of people who disappear in Derry is six times the national average, but for children, it's so much worse. He offers to show them more of his research, and they all agree to go back to his house to learn more. Upstairs in his room, they see all the information he's gathered and learn that when the town was founded, the people who signed the charter all mysteriously disappeared. There was no evidence of an attack, but an old drawing clearly shows Pennywise the Clown hidden in the crowd. Okay, this is really frustrating. Finally, they all have the same information that helps confirm Pennywise the Clown is haunting them, but they don't all recognize it yet because he's appearing to everyone in different forms. This is taking way too long for them to put the pieces together here because nobody is talking about what they saw. But if Ben here was using his brain, he'd realize there's still a way to connect the dots and convince his new friends that this clown is coming after them if he hasn't already. The best thing to do here to get them all on the same page is to confess that he saw this clown with his very own eyes. The key thing here that brings it all together is that in the library, Ben was first afraid of the picture of a decapitated head, and this is exactly how the creature decided to appear to him. Admitting this will encourage Stanley here to speak up about the evil woman he saw in his dad's office and that he was always afraid of that painting. From this one conversation, they could connect the evidence of Ben's research to the string of kids that have gone missing and figure out that this evil clown might be the same shape-shifting monster that is haunting them. It will choose to show itself in whatever form brings out the most fear in that person, and it's only a matter of time before it appears to the other kids as well. Now, if this is just a theory, then we need to prove the theory by predicting an outcome. If subjective fear is what drives it, then we can predict how it will appear to each of these kids. This kid Richie is terrified of clowns, Eddie here is a germaphobe, and Billy here is terrified he'll never find his brother. These kids haven't been haunted yet, but if Pennywise appears to Richie as a clown, to Eddie as a virus, and to Billy as a manifestation of his missing brother, it will prove our theory correct and they'll have no choice but to believe it's real. Once these kids understand that it uses fear as a weapon against us, we need to do everything we can to remove fear from the equation, because that will take away the tool it has to lure us in and kill us, and we can finally get around to talking about how to fight and kill this thing. Later that evening, Eddie here is walking back home and passes by this creepy old house, when suddenly the front door opens and he hears a voice calling out to him. Nervous, he drops his pillbox on the ground and scrambles to pick them up, but as he reaches for the last one, he looks up to find a hideous leper standing in front of him. Horrified, the kid runs away as the man chases him through the gates and deeper into the property. He reaches the back fence, but when he turns around, the leper is gone and a clown is standing there behind him. It asks Eddie to come join him, but the kid runs through a hole in the fence as the clown vanishes into thin air. Meanwhile, Beverly is at home looking through her backpack when a postcard falls out. Hiding from her father, she retreats into the bathroom to read it and discovers it's a love letter from one of the boys. She's touched by the message, but that's when she hears voices whispering from inside the sink. She looks inside the drain and asks who's speaking, and their answer is absolutely horrifying. The voices introduce themselves as all the missing kids from the town. Curious, the girl finds a tape measure and threads it down the drain, but when she pulls it back up, she finds her cut hair soaked in blood and wrapped around the measuring tape. Suddenly, the hair strands fly out and grab her head, pulling the girl towards the drain. She pulls against it with all her strength, but then a geyser of blood erupts out of the sink and covers the entire bathroom in red. Her dad hears her screaming and walks in to check on her. She tries to explain that there's blood everywhere, but the man doesn't see anything out of the ordinary. 
It's completely invisible to him, and the girl has no idea what to do. Okay, this is horrifying because now this monster is entering our homes and it's only a matter of time before we go missing if we don't do something about it. Now, since Eddie here saw a leper, there's no doubt that the monster chooses to appear according to what each child is most afraid of. So if it appeared to Beverly as a geyser of blood, then it tells us she's most afraid of becoming a woman. Earlier in the pharmacy, we saw her hiding a box of tampons because she was embarrassed. We also saw that she was cutting her hair to look more like a boy after her father's uncomfortable advances. At this point, they should both understand that what they're afraid of is being used against them by Pennywise the Clown, and there's no way to avoid it. So now we can finally begin strategizing how to fight it. The first thing we need to do is find a way to eliminate our deepest fears so it can't be used against us. Now, on a biological level, the amygdala controls fear in the human brain, and it sends signals throughout the body to react based on the perceived threat. But one of the best ways to get over fear is through frequent and overwhelming exposure to it. This is known in behavioral psychology as flooding. It's also been used by clinical psychologists to effectively treat patients with irrational phobias. By exposing someone to their phobia and forcing them to confront it, your brain will actually rewire itself to adapt and completely eliminate that fear instinct. Now, these kids will be at greater risk of facing their fears alone because it's giving the clown the perfect opportunity to abduct someone. But this isn't the case if it's done with a large group of friends in a controlled environment. The easiest person to start with is Eddie here, because he's a germaphobe and a hypochondriac. If there's any other way that we can expose him to a lot of germs and sickness with his consent, it will reveal to him that there's nothing to fear but fear itself, and this leper here will not be an effective way to scare him. I would suggest that we expose everyone's deepest fears as a group in a safe environment to strengthen our defenses. At the end of the day, fear is a survival response to danger, so if we arm ourselves with knowledge and experience, then we have a lot more we can use to defend ourselves against its attacks. Later that night, Billy here is woken up by a strange noise from downstairs and follows the sound all the way into the basement. He's shocked to find his little brother Georgie standing there in the shadows, and the kid tells him to join him in the sewers. But Billy is horrified as he watches his brother's face start to decompose in real time. Suddenly, the monster clown bursts out of the water and runs after the kid, but he escapes back upstairs just before the clown could reach him. The next day, the group of friends meet back up, and the girl shows them the bloodstained bathroom. She thought she might be hallucinating, but unlike her dad, all of the kids can see it, and they're shocked. Later, the group ride their bikes back into town, and Billy here admits that he saw something last night as well. The rest of the boys confess they all saw strange things too, and they realize this is not a coincidence. That's when they notice the bully's car parked next to a bike on the side of the road. Realizing someone is in danger, the girl tells them they need to go help and leads the others to the riverbank. The bullies are shoving this boy's face into a package of raw meat, but when he glances across the river, he spots the bloodied face of Pennywise the Clown waving at him with a severed arm. He tries to run away, but the leader holds him down and is about to smash his skull in with a rock when a stone hits him in the head. They all look across the river to find the friend standing there, and before they know it, the two sides get into a rock war. The bullies are outnumbered and the group scares them away, helping their new friend escape a brutal death. Okay, Rock Wars can be a lot of fun, but there's got to be a better way to take these guys out. Right now we're facing both an evil clown and an evil gang of bullies, and that's just way too much for any group of kids to handle. But instead of having to fight both of them, I would try to make them fight each other. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, and that's a lot better than just having two enemies. I would try to find as many ways as possible to gaslight these bullies to make them afraid, because the more fear I can create in them, the more of a target they all become to the killer clown, and the less he will be focused on killing me and my group of friends. I would start by printing hundreds of missing posters with the bullies' faces on it and posting them on all the shops and buildings in town. Then I'd take an anonymous ad out of the newspaper that reads, Bowers Gang Next to Go Missing. If we find enough ways to gaslight him like this, it might be enough to make him and his gang fearful that they'll be going missing next. And if that's what he fears, then the killer clown will make his fear come true. They all head back into town where the group discovers another kid has gone missing and the flyer has been placed on the top of Betty Ripson, who disappeared only three weeks ago. Ben tells them that based on his research, these disappearances happen only once every 27 years. And if that's true, then the monster clown will go into hibernation after the cycle ends. The group goes to the park where Mike here decides to reveal that his parents were burned to death inside of a house and he was the only one who made it out alive. Losing his parents in that fire is his greatest fear in life and it's exactly how the clown appeared to him when he was haunted. That's when they all finally start to realize that the monster must be taking the form of whatever they fear most. They need to figure out how to stop it once and for all and that gives Billy here an idea. They all go to Bill's garage and set up the projector, lighting up a picture of old Derry on top of the town's sewage system. 
All of the most tragic events in the town's history have happened near one of the sewer lines, and they all lead back to a single point. It's the location of the abandoned house where Eddie saw the leper, and it must be where the evil clown lives. This kid starts having a panic attack and rips the sewer map off the wall. But suddenly, the projector starts changing slides on its own. The kids stare in disbelief as they watch the woman in the photo slowly transform into Pennywise the clown. It's enough to give you chills, and Mike here kicks over the projector to shut it off, but it's not enough to stop the evil creature. The clown suddenly lunges out from the screen into the room, terrifying the kids, but when they open the garage door, the clown disappears. Okay, that was the most epic family slideshow of all time. There was no way they could have expected that to happen, but it teaches us two valuable lessons. The first is, don't go through your parents' old photos because what you find could traumatize you for life. The second valuable lesson is that this clown is now willing to appear to the entire group all at once and is not hiding anymore. Now, if we remember back in the library, Ben here was able to pick up the Easter egg, and it told us that if we can interact with it physically like this, then we might also be able to physically hurt it as well. This is normally where I would point out that these kids are in a garage and surrounded by dozens of tools. I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't even a power salt and a power drill in here, and that could do a lot of damage if we tried to fight this thing off. It would take half a second to reach one of these tools here and start throwing them at the giant killer clown. But this time, I'm saying f that. If I saw this thing jump out of the picture and into my garage, I'm running out of here as fast as I possibly can. This thing doesn't need to turn into some manifestation of our deepest fear in order to scare the living f out of us, because it's perfectly terrifying just the way it is. If we want any chance at standing up to this thing later, we need to find something that can completely eliminate fear on a chemical level, and that's why I would try to get my hands on as many barbiturates and anti-anxiety meds as possible. Some of the biggest breakthroughs in anti-anxiety pharmaceuticals happened in the 1980s or earlier, so these kids could potentially get access to very effective medication to significantly reduce the effects of fear. By chemically weakening our brain's fear signals, the clown will have a much harder time trying to freak us out. Now the downside is that these kinds of meds require prescriptions, but lucky for us, Beverly here has someone on the inside who's eager to help her find what she's looking for, and she might be able to help us steal all the anti-anxiety meds that we need to defend ourselves. Now that they know where it lives, Bill here wants to go after it and save his little brother, but his friends are too scared. None of them want to risk their lives, and realizing they won't help, he gets on his bike to face the clown alone. Arriving at the creepy house, he walks up to the building, psyching himself up for the fight of his life. His friends ride up to the house on their bikes, and the girl tells him it's too dangerous to go alone, so the group picks straws, and the losers enter the house with Bill. As they walk up the stairs, they hear someone crying for help. They slowly walk through the hallway to find where it's coming from, but Eddie here gets distracted by another voice whispering his name, and his friends don't realize they've left him behind. The two kids walk into this room and find no sign of anyone, but the door suddenly slams shut behind them. Eddie runs towards them in the hallway, but the floor in front of him collapses and he falls through it onto the kitchen table, breaking his arm. Looking up in pain, he sees the refrigerator door swing open and Pennywise the Clown steps out of the fridge. The monster approaches, terrorizing the child as he tells the boy that he wants all of his sweet fear. It seems hopeless for Eddie, but his friends suddenly run in and find him in the kitchen with the killer clown. It turns to Bill and tells him he killed his brother Georgie, but the boy is frozen in fear. The clown rushes forward to attack them, but suddenly the girl appears out of nowhere and stabs the clown through the head with a metal fence post. The kids try to help Eddie up, but the monster turns around and this time, he's not playing games. His hands turn into monstrous claws and he swings around, scratching Ben across his stomach before retreating out of the kitchen. Bill here falls after the creature and sees it going down a well in the basement and back into the sewer system. The friends all gather outside, and Richie here insists Bill is putting them all in danger, but Billy refuses to let it go, and they get into a fight. The others break it up, and the girl points out that the only reason they could hurt it is because they were all facing it together, but the others don't want to listen and go their separate ways, leaving the girl and Billy to fight the clown on their own. Okay, these kids are making a huge mistake. For the first time, we actually confirmed that this thing can be hurt, because Beverly stabbed him through the face. This was a major breakthrough, but now they're too scared to fight it, and this is giving this clown exactly what it wants. If fear is driving our actions, then it can easily split us up and kill us. Having said that, a group of seven kids fighting a supernatural clown demon is incredibly dangerous, so if I were Billy here, I would get the friends back together and offer a compromise. If it's just too traumatizing to confront, then we should all consider a way to beat it without ever having to see it again. 
if we know that it lives in the sewer system which connects to this house. It's clearly a point of weakness for this supernatural creature, because these are physical places that we can interact with. When your own life is on the line, and the rest of the town's children are disappearing, it's completely worth it to burn this abandoned building down to the ground to box this creature in, and when the monster retreats into the sewers, then we should find a way to flood the sewers. Now, under normal circumstances, it would be practically impossible, but luckily for Bill here, his dad works at the hydroelectric power plant, and hydroelectricity comes from the potential energy of damned water. Since Billy's dad works for the local dam, he has a better chance than anyone of going with him to work, finding out what it takes to emergency release the dam water and flood the evil clown out of the sewers where he's hiding. Sure, the rest of the town is going to flood as well, and your dad will get fired, but if we calmly explain that we're fighting a supernatural shape-shifting clown that lives in the sewers and still has her brother Georgie, I'm sure they'll understand. All joking aside, the adults in this town are already brainwashed, so the only thing that actually matters is killing this monster. If I had the chance to flood the entire town to ruin this clown's home and drive him out, I would still do it because there's no point in protecting a town that won't do anything to protect you. It's a very unlikely plan, but if we actually pull it off, the town will probably have to evacuate once it's flooded, and as soon as they cross the boundaries of Derry, they're all going to be free from the influence of the evil clown. It just might be the single most effective strategy we have against him. Two months have passed, and Beverly here is leaving her house to meet Bill, but she finds the front door is padlocked shut. Sitting in the shadows, her father says he's heard rumors that she's been doing naughty things with a group of boys all summer. Beverly insists that it's not true, but he doesn't believe a word she says. Managing to break free, the girl runs to the bathroom to hide, but her father comes storming after her. He breaks on the door and walks in, looking behind the shower curtains, but she smashes his head with a toilet tank cover, knocking him out cold. She's about to leave the bathroom, but Pennywise suddenly appears in the doorway and grabs her to take her into the sewers. Later, Billy arrives at Beverly's house, but finds the door wide open. He searches for the girl and finds a message from Pennywise on the ceiling written in blood, warning that he'll die if he tries to stop the clown. The kid realizes there's only one way to help her now and leaves the house to find his friends. In the arcade, he meets Richie and tells him that the monster has kidnapped Beverly and they have to get the others if they want any chance of saving her life. Agreeing to help, they all ride to the abandoned house where Pennywise lives and this time, Mike here brought his cattle gun to take the monster out. Reaching the front gate, the boys drop their bikes and start gathering scrap from the yard to defend themselves before they head into the house to rescue their friend. Deep in the sewers, Beverly here wakes up next to a massive pile of junk in the center of the cistern, but when she looks up, she's shocked to find the bodies of all the missing children floating in the air. She runs towards a tunnel hoping to escape, but Pennywise jumps out and grabs her. Beverly tells the clown she's not afraid of him anymore, but suddenly his face starts to stretch wide open, and when she looks inside, she sees three glowing orbs of light deep inside his throat. Her eyes start to cloud, and she begins to float like the rest of the kids above her. Meanwhile, the kids find the well that leads to the sewers, and they all climb down a rope until they reach the bottom. Crawling through the tunnels, Stanley here thinks he hears a noise behind him and swings his flashlight around, but that's when the kid is suddenly transported to another section of the sewer system. He looks around with his flashlight and realizes all of his friends are gone, but hears footsteps coming from somewhere nearby. Out of nowhere, the woman from the painting runs up to him, and across the tunnels, his friends hear Stanley screaming in fear. They all follow the sound of his voice, but when they reach the other side, they find the monster chewing on the boy's face. Terrified, they can only watch as it backs away into the shadows and transforms into Pennywise the Clown before leaving the boys alone. Okay, this killer clown just Star trek this guy to a completely different part of the sewer without his friends even noticing. Now, the obvious mistake here was not to put a weapon in every single kid's hands. Bill here is literally holding three sharp metal fence posts just in case he needs extras, and that's a greedy way to go about hunting down a supernatural threat. If we know that we only have a chance to defeat this thing as a group, then it's in our own interest to give every single person the best chance at survival. Now, there's one more strategy we should use in case we ever do get split up again. Stanley here is still afraid of this woman from the painting, and that fear makes him a weak target for the monster, but there's still something he can do about it. As humans, we regularly convert our emotions into others on a daily basis without even realizing it. Fear can quickly turn into anger. Fear is a survival tool for avoiding danger, but anger is a tool for confronting it. And right now, we need to trick our brains to use the same survival instinct to confront the threat as the best way to survive it. This one mental shift will take away this monster's ability to scare you, and as we learned from Beverly's case, if it can't scare you, then it can't really kill you either. The kids run to check on their injured friend who starts having a panic attack, but Billy here gets distracted when he notices someone in the distance running down a tunnel. Taking the bolt gun with him, he chases it through the sewers until he reaches a cistern and looks up to find his friend Beverly floating in the air. 
He walks to the scrap pile to find anything that can help him reach her, but that's when he sees a little boy in a yellow raincoat running past. It looks just like Georgie, and the boy walks around to follow him. The others finally arrive in the cistern and find the girl floating high in the air. Working together, they manage to pull her back down and try to wake her up, but nothing is working. As a last resort, Ben takes matters into his own hands by kissing her on the lips, and she suddenly snaps out of her trance. The group hug each other in relief, but that's when Eddie here realizes that one of them is missing. Billy has finally found his brother after a year of searching, and the kid begs to be taken home, but as emotional as it is, the boy knows that this is just an illusion. He says he loves him before pressing the bolt gun to the kid's head and pulls the trigger. They all think it's over, when suddenly the body starts shaking and begins transforming back into Pennywise the clown. Furious, he launches at the kid, but all the others join in to defend their friend and attack the monster. They try to hold it back, but the clown overpowers them all, throwing the kids off and grabs Billy here, taking him hostage. All the kids stand back and Pennywise the dancing clown offers to make them a deal. They can leave the sewers alive if they let him keep the boy, but Richie here tells them they've come too far to back out and swings a baseball bat straight into the clown's face. Everyone starts ganging up on the creature as he desperately tries to scare them by shapeshifting into each kid's fear, but it's useless. They're not afraid anymore, and realizing they've won, it retreats into the sewers and disappears. That's when Billy here looks down and finds his brother's raincoat that he wore on the day he went missing. Breaking down into tears, he finally comes to terms with Georgie's death and his friends gather around to hug him. One month later, the girl tells the gang that when she was floating, she saw a vision of the future. They were all back in the cistern trying to kill Pennywise the clown, but as adults, 27 years from now. Billy here makes them all promise to come back if the monster isn't dead, and with their oath made in blood, they all promise each other that they'll return in exactly 27 years to kill the clown for good. Don't forget to click the link in the description to get the special discount CyberGhost VPN is offering my viewers. This application will protect your data while you browse and give you full access to all blocked content on the internet for just $2.19 a month. It's totally risk-free, so check it out in the link below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.